Bob, it's great that we meet again. This I time I would like well. to talk, and we would like to talk, of course, about mastering fear. And um, yeah, to be honest, I read the book, and I have to say it's fascinating. Thank you. Fascinating with so much for me uh, research, so much uh, research worldwide to get that together, really restudied by you, and then coming with very practical advices, ideas for people in business at home. It's it's really great, and I think the the book also summarizes at uh, um, at last cover, and I would like to to uh, quote that. I think that that's a very great quote saying. Mastering fear, worldwide study with many years of research, have been culled and refined by Bob. Dispelling current myths and revealing practical strategies to maximize passion and performance in any individual, team, or organization. Which is, of course, a very great quote to, um, to tell, yeah, actually to, to make people clear to read the book. Thank you. And, uh, and I experienced myself, so, and I thought, yeah, this interview to give some idea to people when they listen, when they, uh, they, they look at uh, the video to make clear uh, uh, what it's all about in this book. And um, I really had a lot of fun already reading the first chapter. Uh, I had to really deep dive in a lot of detail about <laughs> biology of fear. And yes. you started immediately saying, oh, by the way, the word stress, it doesn't exist and all the things. And you mentioned also I the link to, <laughs> I, I, exactly, <laughs> got my attention. And then you link to, of course, uh, people, human with animal, but you also make links to adults with children with a lot of great stuff in it. And it's all true. I all, you know, recognize this. And then at the end, you come to a sort of conclusion, I will say that fear is a gift. And I thought, I cannot ask you to explain everything, but maybe as a first question, say, okay, could you elaborate a little bit about this biology of fear and explain to us why fear is a gift? Well, in some ways, it's if we didn't have fear, a species such as ours would never have survived. As you know, we don't see well, we don't run fast, we lack the strength of the animals they used to prey on us. And for 95 or 90 or more percent of our time as a species on this planet, we were hunter-gatherers, walking the savanna with animals that were preying on us. So fear was the one emotion that, that allowed us to be cautious and careful. Um, and the other thing that fear does is that it allows us to anticipate problems before they happen and prepare for them. The problem is we've turned fear into a disease and call it by a different name of stress um, and therefore think it's our job or it's the traffic or it's finances um, and we don't realize that the fear we're fe feeling inside is the body's way of trying to prepare and warn us um, that something's happening. Um, just a, a little bit of a side um, uh, point, there's a very famous study um, of 17,000 adults in the United States. And they asked them, in the last year, has your stress been high, medium, or low? And then they fought that, and then um, do you, and the second question is, do you feel that stress is harmful or helpful? Just those two questions. Then they looked 10 years later at death rates. And much to their amazement, the people that had high levels of stress but felt stress was something helpful and positive had the lowest mortality. Even people who had low amounts of stress but felt stress was harmful had high levels of mortality. So because we've taken this emotion that's so critical for us and turned it into a disease, um, we've actually made things worse for ourselves. Instead of seeing fear as a gift, we see it as a disease, as something we're trying to get rid of. When you think about it, Martin, fear um, motivates you all day long. You may have made choices today for food based not on pleasure, but on the fear if you don't take care of your body, it won't sustain you as you're aged. You put your seatbelts on when you get in the car. Why do you do that? You like the sensation of cloth across your chest? You put it on because you're afraid of an accident and going through the windshield. So we do, in fact, many of the people that I presume listening to this or watching this are taking time out of their busy, busy lives to do this. 
in part out of fear that if they don't continue to learn and grow, they won't be, stay successful and meet their obligations to themselves and their organization. So fear motivates us all day long in very healthy ways. And fear is like something that's constant um, surrounding us. Uh, it's constant there. You cannot say, uh, I, I can circumvent fear. Uh, is it? Um, you, you can say that you're surrounded by, well, particularly right now with the virus, um, yeah. everybody you meet on the street, there's an initial fear of, is this somebody who I, uh, I shouldn't get too close to because they're a stranger. I don't know if they're safe or not. So in some ways we're living yeah. in a time of unusual amounts of fear. Um, but we're talking about fear, not just in terms of other people, but being aware of our own fears because the spiritual literature has talked about fear for thousands of years. And they say there's only three basic human fears. The one fear of survival, of course, the obvious one, but there's a fear of not being worthwhile. The reason I didn't get the promotion, the reason I didn't get hired, the reason my friends aren't inviting me to parties is I'm just not good enough. And the other fear is of losing control, which we tend to equate with health or finance. So um, we have basic fears all day long. Now, again, most of the time our environment's pretty predictable for us. Um, and, and, and so we're not conscious of the fear and we don't, and the fear isn't activated. Because if you lived in fear all day long, it would exhaust you uh, and probably cause illness all by itself. Because this ancient mechanism in the brain where fear lives was designed for hunter-gatherers. Because if, if that, like, you, when a lion's chasing you, you're either gonna get up the tree and the crisis is over, or the lion's gonna eat you and the crisis is over. So it was designed for these acute emergencies, not for trying to decide if you're gonna get um, made redundant or not, or if, if somebody loves you or not, or if your kid's gonna do well in school. It wasn't designed for these long-term uh, crises we have. Yeah, what you're also very clear, explain in the book also the effect when you stay too long in this yeah, yes. stress modus with your body, which is very bad for your immune system, things like that. Exactly, and you can it's supposed to wake you up, get your attention, and then create action. Emotions designed to put you in motion. And then I think I understand why you really put so much emphasis in the first chapter to understand what we talk about here. And then reading it, and again, a lot of great examples also in the first chapter, also studies being done, explaining a lot. Then you say, okay, second chapter saying um, what not to do. Eh? Second part will be yes. what to do, but <laughs> what not to do. And right. I also, uh, you mentioned the word dangers to uh -huh. you know, keep it in mind. And it's one of the things, thing. of course, is eating. Uh, I also read uh, eating, oh, I doesn't want to recognize. And it was for <laughs> me also learnful to say that you really say, when you start eating, the stress stops. Okay, it will it's come back again, of course. And yeah. It's not really healthy things like that. I can imagine that. But could you, in your um, uh, explanation, maybe from yours and also related to business, people that are listening, uh, what is not the right way to handle uh, fear? So what is, um, yeah, in, in the words of the dangers, uh, the, uh, right. the word you've used. We use the ac acronym DANGER because these were, we found six, there were six common things people do with fear. Let me talk about it as individuals and then answer your question about organizations. So the D stands for depression. People depress sometimes, now depression is a very complicated disorder. Much of it we don't understand but a simple explanation for mild depression is somebody's depressing something they're afraid to deal with. A very common one and a very destructive one is anger. People sometimes turn their fear into anger and this can get people in trouble. We see this sometimes in business where somebody who is very good at a technical level is now promoted into management. And we sometimes forget that people who manage other people have fears because there's moments when you wake up and realize how many other people report to you have to do their job with competence and integrity for your success to be assured. And at the end of the day, how much control do you have over these other people? That fear is gonna make you either more creative and inventive and inspiring as a leader or more difficult and demanding and controlling. So people who are excellent technical people sometimes become very ineffective or harmful managers. 
So the N stands for negotiation. Now negotiate as a response to fear. Now that sounds like a healthy one. Negotiation has so many positive connotations, but negotiating without an awareness of fear will get you in trouble. I'll give you just one example. The best-selling book, at least in the United States, on negotiation is a book called Getting to Yes uh, by the Fisher, the, uh, the Harvard team. And I stopped counting, Martin, after the 27th time they used the phrase fear or concern because they're reminding the reader, the reason I have to negotiate with you is because I can't give you what you want. If I could, we call it Christmas. Instead, unless I can identify what your underlying fear or concern is, find some way to address it that you had not considered, there's no way to get a sustained agreement. So um, the G in danger stands for griping. Complaining is one thing people do. You see it a lot in organizations that are going through major changes, <clears throat> like the ones we're experiencing now. People sometimes get very negative as, and complain as a way of trying to discharge some of their fear. The E in danger, which you mentioned earlier, is eating. It's physiologically impossible to eat and be afraid at the same time. Fear lives in a tiny part of the brain called the amygdala. It's an ancient part of the brain we share with every single mammal. And the first thing, for example, if a deer is grazing and smells a foreign scent, and the, the amygdala immediately makes it stop eating. Hunger stops. I guess the body, the amygdala wants to make sure you're surviving Eating is not the most important thing at that moment. So the moment you put food on your tongue, it takes literally one thousandth of a second to get to the amygdala. The amygdala assumes the lion's gone away, shuts off the entire fear response in your body instantly. The problem is the minute you swallow that chocolate chip cookie or whatever it is you're eating, go right back to thinking about what troubles you, triggers the amygdala again, requiring more food. Going back. So that's the D, the A, the N, the G, and the E. The R, and which, is, which is really interesting, is when I've, I, in every country I've worked in, from Kazakhstan to Guam, I've asked people, if every other mammal has a built-in response to fear, we must have one too. Because when a deer is frightened, it runs away. When a bird's frightened, it flies away. When a mouse is frightened, it burrows into the ground. When a lion's frightened, it attacks its danger. And the question I've asked audiences all over the world is, if every other animal has a built-in response to fear, what's our response? What are we supposed to do when we're afraid? And nobody has ever come up with the answer until I just ask a simple question. You have young children. When your children are little and they have a nightmare or a thunderstorm in the middle of the night, what do they do? They run to your bed. Yeah. You or your Parents. spouse hold them and say, it's only a nightmare, sweetheart and your daughter or son goes right back to sleep in your arms. That's as complicated as life was supposed to get. There's over a hundred studies, Martin, showing that um, higher primates like chimpanzees and humans, the response to fear is to run to another for support. Um, and so it, it helps with your cardiac health, it helps strengthen the immune system because it shuts off the amygdala, giving you back your thinking brain and allowing you to pursue. So what we, we, we kind of, um, in the organizational psychology, we kind of put it under umbrella of um, teamwork. But how do you define teamwork? Uh, I don't know if we've talked about the Aristotle project because it came out after the book, but Google analyzed 180 of their teams, came up with 250 data points trying to predict which of their teams would be most effective. And nothing was predicting it till a book came out, um, let's see, last, last year called The Fearless Organization by a Harvard um, uh, um, business professor. And all of a sudden the data made perfect sense that the single best predictor of whether a team functions is whether you feel you can take your mistakes, your doubts, your lack of knowledge, whatever it is, your vulnerability to your teammates or to, and or your supervisor. If you felt you could be vulnerable and share and go to your people when you need help, those teams were at the top of the scale. Nothing came close. There were other factors yeah. that were second and third, like accountability, keep, keeping your word, clear goals, but they were like a distant second and third. So uh, this reaching for support is the most powerful biologic way we have of calming our fear. Now, what makes it challenging in many businesses 
is first of all, we grow most of our Western culture, understandably, is based on competition. You got to be the smartest kid in high school that got you into university, smartest kid in the university got you into your advanced training, smart enough to compete with the other people that have the jobs that your your clients are are, are coming to you for and wanting help with. So individual competition is necessary to get us to a place where now we're part of a high functioning team and now we have to shift from competition to cooperation. And some people can do that easily because they grew up in families where they were encouraged to compete because that was necessary, but you felt you could go to your parents with your problems. Other people grew up in families that weren't that healthy and supportive and that competition is all they know which can serve you a fair distance in an organization. But if you're managing other people, trying to lead other people, competition isn't the name of the game. That was yeah. a long answer to your question. <laughs> no, I think I follow exactly based on also reading the book, exactly yes. you're already at the fork and you're shifting in your answer saying yes. you have to choose from the not healthy. And you mentioned in the book, the fork in the road to success eh, yes. using fear uh, to success, meaning saying, okay, reach to another for support, correct? That's in the third yes. chapter, very much your, your, your message. So it's the fork yeah. in the road, not the wrong way. We started talking about that in the danger examples. And then right. you say, okay, fork in the road is uh, reach out for support. Um, it's a strength instead of a weakness. And that was, for me, very powerful, especially when you, in the, the next chapter, start explaining about, well, you call it the gourmet guide, correct? It's like a menu yes. eh? in a different yes. way. And yes. in these menu, uh, this is exactly where you now stop with your answer, but I was, I was really also, uh, I love the example of the praise, the, the praise uh, children example at school. Not to praise them saying you're smart, but praise them saying, yeah, you're really trying and that's good. I was yes, really yes, surprised yes. and I realized happily I did the right thing to my daughter. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not surprised, Martin. <laughs> Your but, consulting skills you brought home. <laughs> yeah, maybe, yeah. But I don't always write. I mean, I, if when I put my daughters here, they will tell you <laughs> my, my, <laughs> my worst part. But they maybe a different point of view. Yeah. <laughs> but maybe also from your side to explain that example, use it as saying, how to uh, yeah, a set of uh, skills, uh, tools to set up for success. And then you mentioned instruction, which we all know about learning and then nurturing spirituality. I also realize I use it myself uh, as well, but also the praise and inquisitiveness. Some examples around that uh, maybe uh, to join from your side uh, to the people. The inquisitiveness. <laughs> Yeah, the research on that is just fascinating. Um, and when I'm doing trainings for groups, we spend a whole day teaching them how to ask questions. And that sounds crazy, because when I ask an audience, how many of you think you're curious, everybody raises their hand. But yeah. I don't think it's curiosity they're raising their hand for. Most of us ask questions all day long to gather data to solve problems. That's problem solving. Yeah. Curiosity mm -hmm. is where you're interested in what's happening in front of you. And so, can you go into a situation sometimes where there's tension, where there's stress or fear and have a difficult employee or difficult colleague and try to under and make your first response to try to understand what it is they're saying um, and to use what we call open ended questions. Can you help me understand what are your thoughts about? <clears throat> now, this sounds like just kind of a nice idea, but over the last weekend, I was reading an article in the Harvard Business Review. Um, they train commercial airline pilots and fighter pilots to do this in the midst of a crisis. That if a pilot is in, if, if, if an engine fails in a commercial airline or there's smoke yeah. in the cockpit, they train the pilots to ask the co pilot or ask each other, What are your thoughts? What can we do right now? Um, Israel and Germany train their, their uh, combat fighter pilots to ask open ended questions in the middle of a battle. So, now, again, to be able to do that when the amygdala is on, when you're already feeling pressure and stress, when somebody's really irritating you or being hurtful or making the work environment more difficult, to come in and say, help me understand what are your thoughts about what's going on? 
Um, what um, and when I when I train audiences to do that, it's very hard to do this. And the more technical and bright you are, the harder it is to learn because you've been solving problems with forced choice questions um, for most of your career. And again, that's not bad or wrong, but if you're going to try to help move people, it has to be by trying to get data first. But it's not natural. It's not normal. You know, if you think if you're having an argument with your spouse is your first response to say, uh, please help me understand what it is I'm doing that's upsetting you. That's not where we start. It, it's, no, it's all your fault. <laughs> that's, it's human. It's understandable, but it's not helpful. So to train right. yourself to, speak, to be inquisitive and ask questions when you're not, not understanding something and when you're upset, when the amygdala is on, takes an enormous amount of skill. But I like the example. I also mentioned, I, I spoke about the book with my wife as well. And we mentioned also, it's really getting back to the element. What's the fear behind it makes you think and react? And to come to that sort of okay. root cause, then you can really talk about it. Uh, for example, I like also the expression saying, to be successful, choose as wisely as you can and then take the risk and read. It's always, if I look at myself, the risk that I start asking for help too late you know it should be easier just say hey this is a risk oh i doesn't feel comfortable hey it's a little bit like uh, who i'm a little bit afraid that and then yes. someone can help me saying hey why why is that oh because of this or that and then you have the reaching out i think it starts yes. with us always as adults think you know i have to do it myself correct that's a lot yes we're asking for help as a weakness and martin if i can yeah. you're a perfect example of this because I would wager you know more about Kaizen than I do, in the sense that I, w I work in medical schools, I do some consulting, but you've lived and breathed in the business world your entire career. You've used Kaizen across a wide number of industries, different size organizations. But in spite of that, um, and, and probably, again, as I say, probably knowing more than I do, you came across somebody who had a different perspective on Kaizen and you reached out. Um, and here, here, here we are hours later getting to know each other and building a, a, a business and personal relationship because you were willing to reach out um, already an expert in Kaizen wanting to get another, another type of support, another type of information. It works like that. True, true. It absolutely works like that. I love it. And that's what we come back also work success about creating teams, uh, asking people for help. A lot of, yeah, it's really what when I'm really successful, so to say, it's always because of sharing false questions and letting others join um, as as a team member in my uh, yeah, yes. room for you know a uh, next step. But it's easy. So, it's so much easier to be competitive, to not want to be vulnerable, to not want to admit uh, that uh, to let pride get in the way. Um, so yeah. it, it, you make it look easy, but it's not easy for people to do that. Yeah, to ask for help. Yeah, agree. Agreed. And then, then you start, I mean, uh, not, not forgetting to mention a very, you, you have a lot of uh, question lists in the book that helps a lot. Uh, page uh, 87 is like, consider respond to following questions and all these very practical questions, ask yourself, and it helps a lot in saying, okay, yes, this I do. Oh, that's another one. I, I should use that. So this, what I look next to the studies you've, uh, you've uh, shared with us in the book, or uh, the research also very helpful to understand what we talk about. Thank and you. then if we then talk about the, the, the uh, chapter five, um, we first talk about staying healthy. So it's the body and we, we talk about reaction to fear, amygdala. You mentioned the, uh, the risk, you even talk about the different studies or cardiac and surgical studies yeah, mentioned in the book. And then, um, yeah, um, maybe um, the three steps uh, you mentioned at the end of the chapter, or at least saying, okay, what is uh, the steps to achieve and to sustain health based on mastering fear would be my question. Well, the first step is, of course, to be aware that, that if you need help, that asking for it is a strength, not a weakness, and to be aware. And again, it's, it's very difficult if you grew up in a family where this wasn't available to you, uh, and you're not gourmet to figure out what kind of help do I need and what am I likely to get from Martin that I won't get from Sandra and, and try to figure out where the chances are better. 
Um, and then another um, thing is how, how do I learn to quiet the amygdala? Because one of the things that spiritual schools have said for thousands of years that the research has caught up with is, and this sounds like a very dramatic statement, you're never responding to the situation, but to the conversation in your head about the situation, right. and that you have the potential to change. I'll give, I'll give you um, just one example, although I, I think you already know this to be true. Um, Stephen Covey, a man who wrote a very um, well-regarded book in the States called The Seven Habits of Highly Effective yep. People. He tells this story um, where he's in a New York subway car all by himself, the underground, they call it in England, I guess. I'm not sure what they call it in your country. Um, um, and so he's, and it's an old system. It's very noisy, but he's in this car all by himself. Car pulls into the next station. Man comes in with three children. Man sitting across from him, the doors close. The kids are chasing each other up and down this car, yelling, shrieking, adding their shrieking to the unpleasant noise of the train. And as Stephen Covey tells the story, his head's full of judgment. People shouldn't have kids if they're not willing to take care of them. Kids these days are spoiled. Before his judgments can get any worse, the man comes over and sits down next to Stephen Covey. This has gone from bad to worse. Yeah. And before Covey can even put a thought in his head, the man says, please forgive my children. We just came from the hospital. Their mother just died. Now, do you think that changed his attitude about these three brats? In a heartbeat. Mm -hmm. So the voice in our head is what is, cre is what is creating the upset and sending the amygdala through the roof. Uh, whether it's we're beating ourselves up because of some mistake or inadequacy or, because, or we're judging somebody else, which then sends the amygdala through the roof and that will um, lower your immune system, shuts down creativity. We've all been in that situation where you feel overwhelmed and you say things that you you wish you hadn't the de next day. Um, yeah. And so training yourself to be aware of that harsh voice in your head and then working to reprogram it. And we can talk about that because there's steps in the book and I'm, we can talk about it if you like, but being aware that this is where that has to start because when you're training managers or leaders, as you know, the first, who's the first person you're managing? yourself. Yes, so unless you've got mastery over your own emotions and are creating the tone you want your employees to have with each other and with customers, uh, the cause is lost. So training yourself to have the kind of cool, the emotional response you want to have in the building. When you walk into the building or you walk into your home, does the factory or the office become brighter and more alive because Martin's here? Uh, when you walk through the door at home, does it feel to your family like it's now a brighter, even more loving environment? Or does it feel like the warden just came on the cell block? So training yourself to have the kind of emotional experience response. Now that's very hard to do. If it was easy, the front page of the newspaper would look very different. We don't seem to be a very peaceful, happy species, but we're capable of it. And that's why, if you don't mind me sermonizing a little bit, it's why names like Nelson Mandela and Mother Teresa are world, world acclaimed, not because of what they accomplished. South Africa still has a huge number of problems and people are still dying on the streets of Calcutta. What they accomplished in the world on some levels was fairly modest, but what they showed us is people who could be in very difficult situations and maintain forgiveness and love and compassion um, in the same way that if right now, if either one of us elevated out of our chairs and flew around the room, nobody would look at their bodies the same way again. So they showed us what humans are capable of. Um, if it was easy, they wouldn't be icons on the planet. Um, yeah. But as so you said, like, it's always a choice we can make, correct? We, we have the potential to make the choice, but the first part is being aware that the, vo that the upset is coming from the harshness in here and reprogramming that. So if you're sitting down with a difficult employee, you can be curious, you can be compassionate, even if, this, even if you're going to have to let this employee go, it doesn't have to be with anger and malice and upset. Um, let me see what we can do to help you because this isn't the right place for you. Can, but again, to get to that place, Martin, as you know, is very challenging to where you've got yep. mastery of your emotions. To stay the right. right, correct, yeah. But being aware that's where the challenge is, not trying to control every employee because that's just not possible. You can yeah. inspire them, you can guide them, you can lead them, 
but you can't control them. No, no. But I have to say, the moment you, you experience the positive effect, eh, when you have this positive vibe, there's always a, a next success, so to say, a positive reaction, which is really also yeah, challenging or, or, or helping to stay on that part of the fork, so to say. There's yeah. also a, a very positive reaction of people you won't expect. Yes. And a little bit of love they give back to you. You will never expect people to give. Some people you think, well, you know, they're different. But no, they give you something you would never expect. But only when you start or yeah, when you're active in a positive way, people will yes. uh, also answer in a positive way. That works like that as well. Because also in your uh, the next chapter six, I mean, we can easily uh, take it uh, from there, talking about work success. There, again, as I say, I cannot say it enough, very nice examples, also studies done related to that, but also uh, business people sharing their, uh, their experience uh, with us. And that's also done in the book you shared with us. And then it's about uh, uh, ask for help and also be able to give help to others. Uh, but especially also uh, managers that uh, want people to come to them, uh, ask for help. And then the question, but do you do it yourself? Mm, never done it before. Well, give the example. Eh? Right. And it's very practical, very basic. But again, what you say, it's not, you have to realize it and maybe build it in as a habit. Do I say it correctly? Maybe in the yes. Kaiser way, build it in a yes. habit and then it stays there. Yes. But um, if, we, if you would summarize a, a few topics on work success, especially for leaders to support their team in relation to mastering fear, then you already mentioned a few things, but maybe a point around sharing, um, you know, get people uh, being part of discussions or what is a, a possible advice you would like to add in relation to work success? Well, the, the most dramatic study I know is in a book called Managing the Unexpected, which is a 15 year study looking at what they called high reliability organizations, ah. aircraft carriers, nuclear power plants, uh, emergency departments, places where you're trying to reduce human error to zero because there's life and death at stake. And basically those organizations that were, that were as, as perfect as you, now again, many of the people watching this are not in businesses that are life and death, but they have the same agenda, and that is reducing errors to the minim, absolute minimum possible or eliminating them if possible, because quality is one of the most competitive things we can offer our, our customers. Um, basically, they found two things. One was what you and I have talked about previously, Kaizen. They looked for mistakes while they were so small, so trivial, so inconsequential, they didn't seem to matter and tried to fix them before they got too big to ignore. Um, the other thing they did was they made it safe, as we've already talked about, for people to bring their problems to higher ups. If you think you made a mistake, you might have made a mistake um, or saw a mistake, do you feel safe bringing it to others? Can you ask for help? Now, amazing how, how amazing it is to create an organization where you feel you can go to your boss and say, I think I may have screwed this up um, or I'm not sure I know what I'm doing and assume that your boss is going to be um, be grateful that you brought it to them as opposed to not. Um, there are some very successful firms um, have a policy that if you have any idea that you want to take to fruition um, and, you want, and you're responsible for the decision, it isn't something you need other people's permission for, you have to at least ask one other person for input. The idea being we're hiring a lot of bright people around you, take advantage of them. If not, you have no business being here trying to create a culture where people feel it's essential to ask for help. So it's just uh, organizations that foster competitiveness as opposed to cooperation. And, or a lot of organizations will sometimes say we, we're, we're all for teamwork, but you get rewarded for individual results, not for helping other people. Um, which leads me to another very famous study uh, in, in a book and, uh, called Give and Take. Um, yeah. by a very famous uh, psychologist working at the Wharton School of Business, very pr a prestigious business school. And he followed people from the, their training through their careers and looked at those who were givers, people who showed up at work looking around to see if other people needed help and if people would come to them for help versus takers, which I think is pretty obvious. And they worked to see, um, and he asked the audience, 
uh, in his, his talks or in the first chapter of the book, do you think givers are at the top or the bottom of the profession? Now he's setting us up for a fall because what he found was givers were at the very top of their profession and the bottom, which was kind of mind blowing, but the, it became obvious what it was. The givers who, were there, who saw helping other people as what, one of the things they enjoyed the most in their job, but set limits because they had their own accountability. And, and if, they were t if their takers came to them for help, eventually they stopped, they just said no, because they didn't want to be taken advantage of. And the givers who compulsively gave and gave and gave to the point that their own the jobs, um, those were the ones that were at the bottom of their profession. So giving, even giving has some sophistication to it. Do you yeah. have the freedom to say no um, because the person's abusing the, the, the um, privilege or because you've got your own work that has to get done first? And then there's again about reaching out for help in yes. case you're a giver and to know what's the... <laughs> The moment yeah. I have to stop and say no. Can I, huh? can I give you one more example? Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I was, work, I was working with an airline that was hiring a bunch of flight attendants. And uh, they asked me if I wanted to observe the process. And they would put four or five candidates in a circle, ask them to stand up one at a time and talk about why do you want to fly for the airline? I said, well, what's the point? As this job doesn't require public speaking. As you know, the person standing up front doing the flight announcement is reading from a script. Correct. So we, we don't even listen to what that person is saying. We're watching the other four because obviously this is a very uncomfortable situation we put them in. Are you keeping eye contact with this poor soul who's standing up trying to look, look uh, uh, competent? Um, are you keeping eye contact? Are you nodding? Are you being supportive of them? Everybody knows we're a major airline in the world. We're not hiring one person. Um, you're not competing against this poor soul. Um, we want to know at 30,000 feet, if there's an unruly passenger in the back of the plane, are you going to come help your colleague or are you going to find something to do up front in the galley? So there's sometimes ways you can do this of, of um, asking, uh, of putting people in situations to see how generous they are. Yeah, it's a different way of looking at people instead of just their competence of, yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah great, great examples. and and. and and it's, it's clear that it's um, in work, there's so many uh, examples to share and thinking and good thinking, question yourself about creating uh, success uh, for you, for the team. Huh? Yes. And, um, and um, just looking at another topic, I think it's also uh, adding to, uh, to what we already discussed. Uh, you mentioned in chapter eight about relationships and sustained intimacy and trust. Yes. And then, um, uh, you explain a little bit about the uh, uh, the triangle. Huh? Yes. And because now that's something I, I think also very interesting to add in this interview from your side. What why are you using this uh, in your book uh, about mastering fear? Yeah, the, well, it's called the drama triangle, and it's one of the yeah. most obscure and, from my perspective, one of the most powerful concepts in psychology. Yeah. Uh, that's it. Um, that um, the gentleman who came up with it, a psychiatrist named Cartman, realized one day every culture in history has had storytellers. You can't find a culture without storytellers. Even those incredible cave paintings in France, 35,000 years ago, beautiful, we think are a series of captions about hunting. So we th every culture has storytellers and all stories are invented in what organ of the body? The brain. All stories are read, heard, or seen in what organ of the body? The brain. So anything that's universal and occurs in one organ must have a biology to it, and he thinks he cracked the code. And I think he's right. Every story has a persecutor or villain, the victim who usually becomes the hero, and a rescuer. Um, you can't tell a story without those three components. So the cartoons when I was a child, the wicked cowboy tied little Nellie up to the railroad track and along came the cowboy, good cowboy and rescued her. Or I don't know if you remember the first Star Wars episode. I think Lucas called it yeah. episode four. Luke Skywalker is minding his own business. The Death Star comes along, blows up his aunt and uncle's house, killing them. He and Han Solo go to rescue the princess. There's no other way to tell a story. Now, if I had an argument with my spouse last night, 
and I'm sharing the story with you, which position am I putting myself in? The victim saying, Martin, you won't believe what my wife did last night. She was so hurtful, so mean. She's the persecutor. I'm the victim. And I'm expecting you to say, Bob, you're a saint. I don't know how you put up with it. You're the most loving husband. How could she possibly find any flaw in you whatsoever? And so what makes human behavior so difficult is that when you and I, if you and I are having a disagreement, we're both fighting for the victim position, trying to convince the other one they did something wrong. There's just no way out. Not to step outside of that triangle and decide, all right, I didn't start this problem. I don't think it's my fault, but I'm gonna see what I can do to fix it is the definition of a good leader, but it's not easy. Now, why does the brain have that, pers- that triangle? You can think of it in two ways. One is um, that from the biology of fear, because the way the brain's organized, if I'm walking down the street in the Netherlands, or I'm a hunter-gatherer in the forest seeing you and I've never seen you before in my life, the first thing my brain is trying to decide based on the cues I'm getting from you, is this a potential friend and ally, rescue or in our language, or a potential threat? Um, Or on an emotional level, if you and I are getting to be friends and I'm opening up sharing some things in my past I'm not very proud of, I'm hoping as I reveal these things, you'll be nurturing and supportive and non-judgmental. My worst fear is you'll be critical and judgmental. So whether it's at an emotional level or a physical survival level, we think that's why the brain is organized that way um, to sort out friend from foe and survival versus threat. So, but again, it's, it's, not a, it's not a model that's very good for management and leadership because you have a difficult employee or a difficult boss, you're sitting there thinking, if this jerk would just da 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 da, da my life would be better. And while it's true, there's no way out of that from that way of thinking, but to step outside and say, I wonder what I could do to help, uh, help my boss so that they're less uh, demanding or difficult or critical or harsh. I wonder what this employee needs and how I could have trained them differently, to step outside of that triangle we're capable of. But none of this is easy. Yep. Or again, the front page of the newspaper would look a lot different. Yeah. Well, learn from you. Start asking questions. <laughs> <laughs> it's a different way. Also. Yeah. Yes. And well, um, one, of my, yeah? one of my colleagues is a, is a, a world-class negotiator helps governments negotiate with each other. And he had this beautiful way of summarizing. He said, the purpose of any negotiation is to create doubts in the mind of that other person about their point of view. No one will let you create doubt unless they trust you. And no one will trust you until they're sure you understand and respect their point of view. So when someone's giving you their argument, for most of us, we're barely listening to what they're saying. We're just already putting together our, our defense or our counter argument, as opposed to truly giving them the message that we understand where they're coming from. This is not easy. Um, you know, if you think about it, if you're having an argument with one of your kids or your spouse, is your first instinct to want to make sure, now let me make sure I understand. When I was with your, your mother, what I did, what, we don't talk that way to each other. It's, well, yeah, you, you are see what you do with my mother. <laughs> We simply argue back and chase each other around that triangle. Yeah. yeah. So it's human. It's understandable. It's human. Yeah. But it's not effective. Yeah. Yeah. It's not effective. I agree with that. But thanks for asking. It's one of my favorite um, topics of conversations at Drama Triangle. It's so powerful. Yeah, it is. And it's really, and again, it has, it has examples and you're sharing with them. You even also consider following, following questions. Again, talk about questions. Yes. Giving uh, everyone that's reading the book the idea. So how should I interpret things? And yes. yeah, again, uh, look at yourself in that. And Would it be okay if I gave your viewers a, a, a way to practice that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because because sure. you can't wait. You can't wait till the amygdala is roaring, till that difficult person is in front of you and accusing you of something to start practicing. Like any skill, whether it's driving or golf, you practice on you practice in some kind of uh, limited environment first. So the way I try to practice, because I'm, because you, again, you never get perfect at this, is at least once a week, if I'm with somebody who d- disagrees with me, whether it's about politics or whatever, um, and I decide it's time to practice, I just see if I can ask open-ended questions in the in the tone of voice and with nonverbals 
that are so uh, good that the person's getting more and more animated sharing with me. Let me give you my favorite example. I was flying from, flying from Tucson, Arizona to Los Angeles. It's about an hour flight. I was sitting next to a woman, we got to chatting. I said, what are you gonna do in Los Angeles? She said, well, I'm just changing planes. I'm on my way to Africa. I said, Africa? What are you gonna do in Africa? She said, it's my 87th birthday and I'm going on a safari. I said, a photography safari? She said, no, a hunting safari. She was going to kill the third of some, I forget what the other two animals were, the third animal from a thousand yards with a high powered rifle for some trophy. I could feel my chest clutch. Yeah. This was not my personal idea of a good time, nor was she my stereotype of a big game hunter. I could have spent the hour trying to make her feel bad. It didn't seem like a very useful um, project. <laughs> so I thought, all right, here's a chance to practice. Can I ask questions that are so open-ended, so curious in a tone of voice that's so neutral that she has no idea? I think this is a terrible idea. And again, the way you know you're succeeding is she's getting more and more animated, sharing with me why this is something she thought was worth all the time and trouble. So you have to practice it enough that just like learning to drive, practice it enough that it gets to be automatic. But again, yeah. it takes a lot of practice. Yeah, and exactly what you say is the wording, but it's also the tone. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I agree with that, yeah. So it, practice, what you say, practice what yeah. you preach and stay on, practice learning, learning, learning. Yeah, yeah. never never finishes, eh? never done. Yes. So. Now, you mentioned earlier, you mentioned just quickly saying it's not always easy um, when you're from your birth in a different position <laughs> to choose the right thing. In, in chapter nine, I mean, you really talk about who people, uh, why people choose the wrong path and how to re-choose. And then you mention three reasons why uh, we choose the wrong path. And one is cultural and family lies. And, and I think you mention a lot also in the book that sometimes the cultural family life are really, yeah, they, they sort of um, put us in a position and it's very really hard to get out of that. When you have a hard youth, uh, honestly, I have had a fantastic youth, so I'm really privileged with that. But yes. people have a hard situation, sometimes even in war or whatever, or not a, a stable situation. It's very hard to get out of that. Um, a few words maybe from your side about that for people that are have been in a very tough position. Yes. Yeah, if you grew up in a family, as you were um, saying, where when you went to your parents for support, um, the support wasn't there. Now, there's a lot of reasons why that happens. Sometimes, as you say, because of war or economic things, your parents are just so busy divorce. trying to keep you on yeah. the table. Divorce. Um, and not just divorce by itself, but divorce where the parents are so acrimonious, so in so much conflict and difficulty and, one, and, and not very nurturing to you, their child, um, it creates it. Or sometimes you, you went, the stereotype, and at least in the US, is when you went to your parents for a nightmare, your father or mother said, shut up and go back to bed or I'll give you something to cry about. Now, sometimes our parents do that because they're truly wounded souls themselves and got bad parenting from their parents who got it from their parents. But sometimes our parents are doing the wrong thing for the right reasons. Your parents are always training you for the world they grew up in. Um, my grandparents were immigrants during, the, uh, during World War II. My father grew up in the Great Depression and during World War II. Um, so they, they were lived in incredibly hard times. So my father was trying to make me as tough and hard and self-reliant as I could be, preparing me for the next depression and world war. Unfortunately, or fortunately, I'm saying sarcastically, the world went through a time of peace and prosperity. I thought he was too hard on me. But if, if I had to go through the hardships he went through, he would have prepared me perfectly for it. So sometimes our parents are training us for the world they grew up in, and uh, it's, it, you, but who, who can predict the future? So for any of those reasons, if you learned in childhood not to go to your parents, then when life got difficult, you pull up the drawbridge, fill the moat with water, take care of it yourself. And you, be, you become relatively um, uh, closed down, very competitive usually, because you're trying to succeed in the world without needing anybody else. And as we've talked about, you can get a fair distance in life by being competitive. It's a good skill to have. It's just not the only skill. Yeah. So if you're trying Correct. to create a romance or family or deep friendship or work effectively as part of a team, uh, individual competition isn't the name of the game. Yeah. 
and the many fears that will surround us and we will encounter, yes. we really need to reach out and we need support yes. or even be able to give support, correct? Yes. Which is yes. also being part of a, uh, of a team or a community. And I think exactly, exactly in, in the book, the, the chapter uh, when, when we go to reaching for uh, support, um, steps for helping others learn to reach for support, uh, again, many great uh, questions to ask, uh, things to uh, think over uh, are in the book written down. Uh, many, many questions, many things to, to uh, not even use in, um, in sessions with your team, correct? In yes. business or together with the family and talk about uh, really catching up here. Do we have points of attention here? How do we, yeah, you could say success, but how we can improve um, relation and be successful? Yes. So it's, I think, uh, again, um, first of all, it started with uh, fantastic research and thousands of, of people being uh, part of it and many different research, but as well also your advice based on your experience and, and understanding of it uh, to so many topics, how to, uh, to handle it and how to take it uh, from there in your own situation. Maybe yes. from your point, uh, uh, Bob, maybe a last comment regarding mastering fear. Uh, last comment, uh, as uh, being at the end of the book, you mentioned uh, again. Uh, what was the last uh, comment? One essential skill. It is the wording yes. of the chapter ten. We are meant to reach to another for support. Yes. Yeah? When I when I ask audiences at the beginning of a workshop, what do you think is the most important skill you want to see in a person before you trust them? Whether it's someone you're negotiating with on the other side of the table, an employee or colleague, or a romance, um, and where we end up is you want to know what that person's going to do when they're afraid. Until you know what a person does when they're frightened, you don't know anything important about them at all. Because romance at times gets scary, friendships can be scary, and certainly in work environments, fear shows up. Um, and when that person gets afraid, are they going to come to you and say, I need help? Or are they going to run through you on the way out the door or try to just make their best guess and see if they can get away with it in a business situation, try to hide their mistakes. So knowing what a person does when they're afraid, like that airline tried to do with those flight attendant applicants uh, is the biggest challenge. Yeah. Well, thanks. As I said at the beginning, it's a fascinating book, but also very practical, which is a great combination for everyone in business as well as in private life. Thanks for sharing your uh, experience. Thanks for sharing your time with us. And I hope many people will, uh, well, will use the book as a practical guide in their lives. And the, the other thing is they're going to they're gonna see from you a way to be inquisitive because you ask wonderful questions. Thank you, Martin. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Bob. Thanks.